So hopefully everyone can hear me okay and um, can see my screen here on Growing Vegetables in Central Oregon. Okay, so this morning we're gonna talk about challenges of gardening, different types of gardens you can have or plan for. Um, the challenges we're gonna be addressing just the climate here and how that affects gardening in general. And we'll talk a little about the site prep, selection, what to plant, when to plant, those sorts of things. We'll cover seeds, what you need to know about starting seeds or versus uh, direct seeding versus using transplants and then plant care, care, excuse me, crop rotation, season extenders and garden cleanup, just in, in general or brief. Before we get started, I do wanna mention this is, I, my name is Amy Jo Detweiler and I am an extension horticulturist with Oregon State University Extension Service. Uh, we are located here in Central Oregon and Redmond and we serve the Tri-County region and bringing classes like this to you. And we've got a lot of different programs and basically what we do in extension is we bring the research-based information to um, backyard growers, homeowners, uh, people in their livelihood, uh, this type of information. Okay, let's get started. So here are some of the bigger factors that can affect you when it comes to vegetable gardening. You've got hardiness zone, soils, precipitation, temperature, and elevation that are all gonna affect the success of whether or not a plant's gonna grow well here. So we'll go and cover those in general. So hardiness zone is not really a big concern when we're talking about growing vegetables because they're mostly annuals. There's just a, a couple of them that are perennial type vegetables or perennial crops. And so you can grow most vegetable crops here uh, if you stay within the parameters of our growing season. And we'll talk about how long that is in a little bit here. But hardiness zone in general is more for perennial plant material because hardiness zone, that number reflects how something survives through the winter months, not the summer months. Uh, the key here as far as finding plants that are gonna work for your vegetable gardening are gonna be selecting short season crops. And I'll get into more details on what types to look for there. And um, if you're gonna use a perennial crop, for example, like asparagus or rhubarb, ones that are gonna come up every year, then you just wanna look for the cold hardy varieties of those ones so that they'll work successfully here in Central Oregon. Soils, we'll talk about amending the soil a little bit later, but just wanting to introduce you, if you're, especially if you're new to the area, we have predominantly a sandy type soil, the volcanic soils here. And so what that means is we've got good drainage, which is great. Um, but the other side of that is that we have very little organic matter in our soils, um, generally speaking, less than 1% organic matter in our native soils here. And so that means you're usually having to amend the soil to improve the soil quality, meaning you're providing nutrients, microorganisms, and you're gonna improve the water holding capacity for your vegetables. Ideally, the goal is to create that ideal environment for the roots to thrive, and they need water, they need oxygen, and that they can pull nutrients up to the plants. Precipitation plays a factor here. Uh, we don't have a lot of annual precipitation relative to other parts of the state and other parts of the country. Normally, we get between 11 and 15 inches of annual precipitation, um, most of which is in the form of snow. So when you're growing here during the growing season, which we'll loosely use that April through September as the markers for the growing season here, uh, the natural precipitation rate is anywhere between four and six inches in any given year. So not real high. So what does that tell us about vegetable gardening here? You're gonna to need to use supplemental irrigation for most of the crops you're gonna grow. Um, and ideally, you're gonna be delivering even and consistent moisture. So you're either gonna to need to um, 
hand water with a hose or you're going to have to have an automatic irrigation system set up to keep your vegetable crops going. This is interesting. I just pulled a 10-year data set from Ben's and just wanted you to see the, the data here from 2008 to 2017. And so that second column there is the number of days where the minimum temperature was 32 degrees or lower. How many days in there where the temperature dropped below 32 degrees during the growing season? And you can see how that varies depending on the year. Um, some years uh, we got away with uh, having just a few, like 2014, 15, and 16, just a few days in there where the temperature dropped down. Uh, but generally we we're looking at usually about 20 days during the growing season where that temperature drops down pretty low and can affect your very tender or your frost tender annual vegetables. So historically, and looking at 110, a 10 year uh, historical records from the city of Bend, this was kind of fascinating to learn. There were just a handful of dates when looking at these records that where the temperature did not fall below um, 33 de degrees. And so it's kind of fascinating to know that there was just those few dates where every year you can count on July 10th or you could count on July 20th or that that wouldn't get too cold. But otherwise, any of those other dates in there in July and August potentially could drop down below freezing. And so what that tells us is we really don't have a true frost date in Central Oregon and you need to be prepared for that when you're growing vegetables. So that means having frost protection in place ready to go in case we have one of those days where the temperature really drops down. Really, that window between July 15th and August 19th, you'll have less than a 20% chance for freezing temperatures. But otherwise, we really can get frost any day of the year here for the most part. Our growing season, normally a growing season is defined by the last frost date in spring and the first frost date in the fall. But given the information I just showed you, uh, we really don't have a real long stretch but so this is kind of a, a guideline. It's not an absolute, but it's a guideline. And you can see that the average number of growing um, days in, the in each of the different cities here um, varies a little bit. It's usually anywhere from the shortest growing seasons being about 70 days up to the longest growing seasons being about 110. And again, that's kind of loosely defined because we really don't have true frost dates here. And you can see there's a direct correlation between the growing season, the number of days in the growing season, and the elevation. As you go up in elevation, the growing season becomes shorter. So this just gives you a marker depending on what city you're, you live in. Uh, just real brief, garden tools. These are just some of the more common tools somebody might use if they're vegetable gardening. And really it comes down to personal preference. I find that most people are gonna end up finding their favorite tools and that's what they'll use over and over again but you may wanna have some of these on hand, like a pitchfork or a spade. A garden trowels are always gonna be helpful. And then some of the garden equipment you'd wanna have um, with really the priority in my mind being a soil thermometer of all the ones on the list here. Um, you can have watering cans, stakes for marking what you're growing. That's always important. You wanna be recording what you're growing, not only maybe in the ground right next to it or and or actually keeping up a garden journal so you remember what you planted, you remember what you liked and what you didn't like. And if you're using a cold frame or starting things undercover, a maximum thermometer might be interesting to have on hand. Um, but soil thermometer is gonna be one of the most important pieces of garden equipment if you're planning to direct seed right into the ground because this is gonna tell you when the ground is warm enough and that those seeds will be successfully germinated based on temperature. And I'll discuss that a little bit more in a later slide. I also, you'll see, I have on this list masks. And I know we're, there's a lot of conversation about masks given the current environment, uh, but it is important when you are opening a bag of seed, seeding mix for seedlings or you're opening a bag of 
potting soil or you're working with compost to wear a mask. Um, you don't really want to be inhaling some of those really lightweight particles that may be in those mixes. And so it's just important to wear gloves and a mask so that you're not breathing those in and keeping uh, protecting your lungs there. Um, the other thing that can sometimes happen is if you have a, you know, a bag of potting soil that you've had outside, it's sitting in the sun, it's gotten a little wet, you open that up, there's some bacteria in there, you just don't want to be inhaling that. So when you go to prepare that, you know, make sure you're in a well-ventilated area when you're opening those bags of soil and uh, potentially be wearing a mask would be a good idea always. And then pre-wet the soil so that it's not real dry and fly away. When planning a vegetable garden, you want to ask yourself who's going to do the work and what do you and your family like to eat? So um, you can either grow just for your family or you can grow and you can grow some extra to be donated. Uh, the food bank always appre appreciates some fresh donations. There's lots of places to donate fresh produce if you like to grow and, and don't think you'll be able to eat it all. Think about the types of crops that you can use for canning or storing. And so that's always a good idea as well if you like to do food preservation and the extension service offers a lot of classes on food preservation as well if you have an interest in that plan on paper select seeds to start indoors um, this this we're right in that planning stage right now you should be starting seeds up right now if you're going to be starting seeds that you'll plant into the garden in a few months here there's some really cool online tools that you can either get. Some of them are free. Some of them are more extensive and they have a subscription fee with them. We're going to try and share the screen with you on, the, on one of these. Let's see if I can get this to work here. Hopefully you're seeing this YouTube video and I'm going to try and start this uh, up.
Okay, sorry uh, about that. Sounds like you guys didn't have sound with that video, but I just wanted to, hopefully you could just visually see, um, and here are some websites that can be, you can go to. So that particular website is called growveg.com. It's a subscription-based garden planner. And just to give you a little background, since you didn't have the sound there, uh, what that planner does is you it helps you with spacing it helps you select crops so that you have it you you put in the parameters of your your spacing and it will tell you how many of each plant you can put in that particular area it has a really wide selection of crop choices you can also put on there i'm going to put row cover on this crop and it will tell you when you plant can plant it there's a whole bunch of really cool innovative uh, pieces to that website. So something like that's interesting. And I think I looked at it yesterday. It looked like it was maybe $29 for the subscription for a year and that will hold your information from season to season. But there's also some other two tools online. Like for example, the, the one on the bottom here, the www.gardeners.com. That one is a free kitchen garden planner. It's not, not as extensive as the one I just showed you on the YouTube video but it's another tool that you can use if you'd like to have those online, something to help you plan the spacing of your garden. With planning, you, you can have fixed or flexible plots. Um, there's a lot of different ways to plan, and it really comes down to how much space you have in the site selection, what you have as far as full sun goes, because most of your vegetable garden crops are gonna be ones that need full sun. But here's just some examples of different types of designs, layouts. You do want to think about the orientation of the sun and put the crops that are going to get the tallest, you know, so that when the sun is over towards the west, that those taller crops are not going to be shading out crops and behind it. So think about spacing when you're putting your plants in the ground that way. You can have some fun designs depending on the amount of space you have. Um, even when you're gardening in something as small as containers, you still just want to think about placement, putting the tallest plants in the back of the container based on the direction of the sun. So you want those taller plants not to be shading anything out as the sun moves overhead and goes towards the west. Here are just some different. This is Holland's Head Community Garden in Bend. If you haven't been there, this is probably a, about mid-season there. Raised beds. Um, raised beds are a really nice choice for Central Oregon because they actually help to extend the season here. As you, as you get more soil depth above ground, you actually will have that warm up earlier in the season and it will hold heat later in the season. So you can actually direct seed a little bit sooner in a raised bed or just it'll help the roots to grow and establish the plant more quickly in a raised bed. Usually if you're going to do a raised bed, you can see here on the right there's a smaller raised bed, just one um, a little two by fours holding that out, but that's going to help increase and warm that soil up a little more quickly. If you are going to use wood, you can use wood or other materials to enclose a raised bed. Use untreated wood, ideally, since you're dealing with food crops. Or if you're going to treat the wood, you can find food grade varnish, and that would be safe to put on the wood to help preserve the wood. Or you can try and find woods that are naturally more rot resistant, like cedar and western juniper. All the western juniper we have around here, jun western juniper happens to be really rot resistant. It's in the same family as cedar, um, insect is re resistant. And so it's another choice for you if you want to use something like that. Depending on the type of raised bed and where you're putting it in, I would recommend you use hardware cloth. It's about uh, one fourth an inch in size as far as the spacing on the hardware cloth. You put that in at the bottom if you're going to have any concern with gophers coming up. We've got pocket gophers here and some other critters that may burrow up and under. So that's an important thing to think about if you're going to put a raised bed in. Here's some other examples or images. And on the left is that's those are uh, Western juniper rails that we use to put in a couple raised beds at Holland's Head Community Garden. And um, on the right there are some beds that were put in at a garden on the northwest side of Bend, uh, Northwest Crossing Community Garden at the time. 
and those were made from cedar, I believe. Vertical gardening is something else to consider. It's a fun way to grow, and it's really good if you have a small space to grow in. That means you can grow plants that usually take up a lot of space. For example, cucumbers that are usually sprawling and vining, you would be able to trellis them going upright, and that way they wouldn't be taking up near as much ground space. This is just a fun one to throw in there. Um, this is a, an, a planting technique called Three Sisters, where you plant several plants together so they all kind of serve an individual purpose. And I thought it's just fun because of where we live. But you would grow the corn, so the corn would be kind of a natural trellis for the, the beans. And then you plant the beans at the base of it and the beans can trellis up the corn and the beans will also fix nitrogen in the soil, which helps the corn and the squash get nitrogen. And then you would have squash or pumpkins at the base, and they're gonna create a ground cover that kind of keeps moisture in around all three of the plants and, and keep the weeds down at the base of the plant. So you can try innovative techniques like this in growing all three crops in a small space. Container gardening works really well too for vegetable crops, but what you wanna look for is compact or early varieties. So you're not gonna have as much room. You want something that's gonna mature fast or something that's gonna be compact so it's gonna fit in a container. And oftentimes you'll have seed companies recommend these are good for container gardening. If you're going to try and grow something like tomatoes in containers, then you just want to get something that's going to have a pretty uh, deep root or depth to it. Some Usually about 18 inches minimum for tomatoes or something like that. Um, for shallow rooted crops, you would just go 8 to 10 inches deep. But for those, um, something like a half whiskey barrel would work or a five gallon container plastic pot from the nursery would work for some of those deeper rooted plants. It's not that something like tomatoes won't grow in a container that's more shallow, it'll just slow the growth down and you probably won't get as much harvest or yield. Square foot gardening is another technique you can use where you just kind of have a plat, you, it's uh, just using two by fours and some wood lattice, you would go ahead and create little one, um, one foot by one foot squares and the idea is that you plant just one individual crop in each of those squares and so that you have a variety of crops in a very small space. And there's some books out there on square foot gardening if you have an interest in something like this. Arrangement's gonna be important and I show this slide. This is a slide from a while ago at the demonstration garden in Redmond. This is the OSU demonstration garden. We have um, annuals and vegetables we plant there every year. And then we also have perennials, trees, and shrubs that are labeled for people to come out and take a look at those. But one of the things that we do there is we intermix our vegetables with flowers. And part of that is so that we're attracting pollinators. And so it's just one, a reminder to when you're thinking about design and spacing and planning um, to think about attracting pollinators, the native pollinators, to your garden as well so that you're including some flowers and I'll show you some lists on where you can get that information on what works well here for this region. So this is our garden in the demonstration garden in June. This is what the garden looks like in July. No, not really. Don't worry, the, uh, it's not usually quite that bad, but it can get cold even in July. But this is later in the season, probably from a different year, the same garden. Um, you can see we intermix flowers and or vegetables together. So here are some websites for pollinators and you can see we've got a couple different here. Uh, the Xerxes Society, which happens to be based in Portland, um, has some really good fact sheets on different pollinators for the region and then also uh, the guide here on the right, selecting plants for pollinators. Um, if you go to that website on the bottom there, that's going to take you right to this guide. It's a it's like a 20-page PDF, and it's going to have a list of plants that work well in our part of Oregon. So there are some good options there for you. 
give you a second to write those down or copy those. You can copy and paste some of these websites or bring them up and Okay, site selections is a big one here. It doesn't it seem like this is always the case, um, especially in Central Oregon where we have volcanic rock. So you want to you want to pick a site if you're going to be gardening directly in the ground that's going to be pliable and where you're going to be able to allow root, some rooting depth in the soil. If the soil's compact, you're going to want to loosen that up. Find a location that has full sun. You can get away probably with a minimum of six hours of full sun, but ideally eight to 12 is going to be better and you'll probably get a, a bigger harvest if you have a full sun selection uh, site. You can look for slope sites using terracing. If you have a hillside and you're trying to figure out how to work that, create some terracing in there and you can garden that way. Ideally, you're choosing a spot near the house um, only because if it's closer to home, near the house, the back door, the side door, you're probably more likely to be monitoring your gardening, seeing what's happening, versus if it's a, in a spot really far away, you're probably less likely to be checking in on the garden. And then it's also critical to have a water supply nearby, whether you're gardening with a hose or if you have an automatic irrigation system set up, you have a water supply nearby. Avoid low spots and windy sites. Most vegetable crops don't like windy sites. And so if you have no other choice but to put your garden location in a windy site, try and create a wind block that won't cast too much shade. Avoid those spots that are going to collect cold air. And then also think about your critter damage. Um, what kind of wildlife do you have that may wreak havoc on your garden? So normally here we're concerned about deer, are going to be the big ones. If you if you don't have protection from the deer, they're going to munch down your garden pretty quickly. Other things you'll want to think about would be rabbits, rock chucks, ground squirrels, and pocket gophers. Uh, we do have some moles here, but moles are, they eat insects, not vegetation, and so they're less likely to cause damage. It's really going to be the pocket gophers and deer and rock chucks probably creating the most havoc in your vegetable gardening. So think about ways to be innovative and, and exclude them from the garden. So this is just showing you a fence. Uh, we put this fence up. This was the original site for Northwest Crossing Community Garden. It's not there anymore. But we put a fence up to protect from the deer getting in. And then at the bottom of this, I just want to show you the use of hardware cloth. This is the hardware cloth I was referring to to put at the bottom of a raised bed as well. But you can see it's just, uh, this is quarter inch hardware cloth and it's actually buried about 10 to 12 inches below ground here too. And that's to keep burrowing rodents out of the garden as well. And then we have it riding up the fence a little bit there and then we kind of flip it over at the edge. And that's theoretically, some of the ground squirrels are less likely to go up and over that lip if you create a lip like that. So just some techniques like that are gonna be helpful and managing the wildlife, keeping them from eating down your crops. Somehow they typically always find a way back in, though it seems, but site preparation goals. Ideally, you want your soil pH to be somewhere between 6.2 and 6.8. And we talked about the soil being well-drained. Our native soils are gonna already have that for you. Um, we actually wanna increase the water holding capacity a little bit if you're gardening right in the ground. Uh, and our goal for organic matter or material is anywhere between three and six percent total for organic matter. The, the, the site needs to also have room for air and water and so you don't need to have a real high percentage of organic matter that's going to be too much for the plants. They just need somewhere between three and six percent and you can continue to amend the soil and build it each season. Our native soils here generally tend to be about 7.0 as far as pH goes, which is neutral. Um, most vegetable crops will grow in that, but it's, it's ideal to try and lower that pH a little bit. And the way to do that is by adding organic matter, or you can add uh, elemental sulfur as well. 
You don't necessarily have to do a soil test on a new site unless you're concerned about something else maybe previously been grown there, what you're starting out with. But we've got several publications on our website, which I'll show you at the end here. And you can go there and we've got a how to take a soil test publication. We have a how to interpret a soil test guide and then also um, a list of laboratories that do soil testing. Central Oregon, we don't have anyone in the area that actually does the testing on site. There are a couple places that will take your soil test for you and send it out, or you can send it out directly um, to some of those locations that we have in our soil test lab guide online. So here's what I was talking about. Uh, normally in Central Oregon, oops, let's go back here. Um, our soils tend to be a little more alkaline, if anything, neutral alkaline. So adding elemental sulfur is the best way to lower the pH in a, in a larger gardening plot or area. If you have a smaller area, like a raised bed, you can just usually add um, a fine compost, organic matter. You can um, age manures. Those types of amendments will help lower the pH. Site preparation, um, if you're using compost, you want to try and find compost that's a weed and weed seed and disease free. So if you're using compost, you want to make sure it was hot composted so it kills off any weed seeds and any pathogens that may be present in the soil. You don't want to use cat, dog, or pig nores because they have pathogens in them potentially that can be transferable to human and affect your health. So you don't want to be using those but you can use other types of manures, cow manure, horse manure. You just want to make sure that the manure has been aged and um, just be aware of where the manure is sourced from. Every once in a while you can get manure that has herbicide residue carryover in it from the, the hay fields that were sprayed. And so, and that will show up in your plants like you can see in these images on the right here. This is examples of herbicide damage in two different crops where you get the puckering, distortion. And so sometimes if you see, you know, free manure on the side of the road, you just want to make sure that there's no herbicide residue carryover. And the way to find that out is to ask that where, uh, where the, the animals grazed and make sure that, that there's no herbicide that was used that could potentially still be in the manure. And you can do a little test with that as well. If you want to, if you're not sure and you want to use the manure, but you're not sure if it has herbicide residue carryover, just take a, a little bit of the manure, put it in a small four inch pot and put some seeds like peas are a good indicator crop and make sure it's growing up and looking without having any of these symptoms like you're seeing on the right here. No puckering, no distortion. So when you're growing vegetables, they're going to require more nutrients than your ornamental plant material like your perennials, trees, and shrubs. So you want to be feeding the soil with some sort of amendment or compost. There's a lot of different landscape supply companies and local nurseries that provide nice compost. You just want to do your homework, ask them for a soil test analysis to make sure that this, the compost you're buying has pH in that range we talked about. They should have a pH indication on the soils and a, a fine soil usually works well to help amend the soils. Other ways you can continue to build your soils is by adding a cover crop. And you can do this in the spring here in Central Oregon or the fall. Uh, another name for cover crops is green manure. Uh, cover crops are going to be a crop that you put down, you let it come up, you let it start to grow. You just don't let it go to seed or um, get too far along. And you can just turn that back in and that's going to add some green material to your soil and help build the soil. It also helps decrease compaction and prevent erosion in some cases if you're gardening on a big plot. Usually with cover crops, you can do them late season here. You can do spring or fall, but a lot of people like to do fall when they're done gardening. You can put something in and turn it back into the soil. Here are some of examples of different cover crops that you can use here in Central Oregon. So you can write some of those down. And all of this information, I should have shared this in the beginning is in the publication that we have called Growing Vegetables in Central Oregon. And I'm going to show you the website where you can find that. We typically 
give that publication out when we do these classes in person. But um, I'll show you there. It's, it's also available online. And so all of this information that I'm sharing with you can be accessed in that publication. So you don't need to be vigorously writing any of this down. Take some notes if you want. Here's an example of a cover crop that came up. This was uh, from a while ago at the extension office. We let this come up and you would go ahead and turn this back in the soil and let it sit through the winter months to enrich the soil. There's debate about whether or not you should be tilling your garden soils and my suggestion would be to, if it's compacted soil and you're planting in it for the first time, you want to lightly loosen it up so that the roots have a place to go. Uh, you, can, you can till lightly um, the first season and then from there on out, you can just till lightly going forward. You don't necessarily need to be heavily rototilling every single season. There's some benefit to just tilling on occasion when you need to and uh, just keeping that soil pliable more than anything. When you do some heavy duty rototilling, you're gonna be kind of breaking down the soil structure, which you don't want to do. So you can till initially, and then you can till as needed going forward in, in the continuous seasons. Okay, now we're gonna to switch to using seeds. Uh, if you're going to be starting your own starts or direct seeding, um, when you're purchasing seeds, you wanna be looking at short season seeds. If you're buying store-bought ones, those are gonna be true to type. Um, and there may be some other outlets for seeds, but you just wanna make sure that you're, you're getting what you think you're getting. Uh, the nice thing about growing from seed is they're relatively inexpensive and you can use them usually a couple of seasons in a row. Most seeds have a shelf life on them but usually you're gonna be able to get away with using seeds for a couple seasons in a row, depending on how much you wanna grow. The, uh, some of the seeds are gonna be bred for high disease resistance so that you have a more successful crop. And sometimes we'll get questions in the OSU Extension Service about the difference between heirloom or open pollinated. Those are gonna be one and the same. Um, and here's just some basic information about heirloom. If with heirloom seeds, you're going to be able to get the same traits from one generation to the next. So you would be able to potentially save the seed from your heirloom crop and, and have it be the same plant the following season. Uh, so that's one advantage to growing with heirlooms. Um, sometimes you can get genetic drift with those, meaning that they will uh, evolve or change a little bit or cross-pollinate, and then you may not end up with the same plant that you started with the first season. But in general, that's what heirloom seeds are and um, also known as open pollinated. The downside uh, to heirlooms is sometimes they don't have the disease resistance in them that you may be looking for with certain crops. And that's where hybrid seeds can be uh, an advantage because they are improved for disease resistance in certain cases, depending on the crop. The downside to hybrids is that you're not gonna get, if you save the seeds from a hybrid plant, you're not gonna get the exact same plant uh, when you try and grow it again the next season. And so uh, there's pros and cons to using either one of those. And the other issue I wanted to address just briefly is uh, the concern for genetically modified organism seeds, GMO seeds. And just know that as a home, as a backyard gardener or a home gardener, GMO seeds are not available to the general public. And so, that you don't have to worry about purchasing a seed that has GMOs. When to plant depends on the crop and whether or not you're gonna be starting from direct seeding or starting from starts. And we have in our vegetable gardening guide that I'm gonna show you the website for it. In that guide, we will have suggestions on the crops that grow well here and whether it's better to direct seed them or start them from transplants. So I want to talk a little bit about the way plants grow and uh, temperature. So the ideal growing 
a temperature range for plants is 50 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's air temperature. And when plants get in this, this ideal range, then they're going to be able to do all the things they need to do to produce well and create a good harvest for you. So after 50 degrees or higher, then plants can actively photosynthesize. And when they photosynthesize, that means they're creating, they're able to create their own food, and that's going to keep them growing and get you to a maturation where the plants are gonna have some good harvest for you. When you get outside this ideal range of 50 to 90 degrees, it affects the way the plants can operate. It's the, it affects the physiology of the plant. And so what happens is, if you get below the 50 degree mark, plants will slow down their growth processes in several different ways. And they may even cease growing, and so, one of the challenges we have in, here in Central Oregon is we have these really big swings between day and evening temperatures, even during the growing season. So you may have, you know, a 70 degree day, but if it, it may drop down to 48 degrees at night. And then when that happens, that slows the plant down. So you don't have this continuous growth going on through the evenings here. Same thing happens on the other end of that. If you're growing in a greenhouse and you're under cover and that greenhouse is maintaining temperatures above 90 degrees, then that's going to slow down the physiological processes of the plant and it will stop it from growing. If you're in really hot temperatures, you'll also see it affect pollination and fertilization, so you may not get crop set. So you really want to try to stay in that ideal growing range as, um, as much as you can. And given that we can't control the temperatures here, you want to have some frost protection in place and you also want to be planning for this. And so when you're selecting seeds, you want to select seeds that have the shortest growing season because the season here, um, we don't get the same amount of growth as they would get in other places where they don't drop down so cold during the summer months. The air temperature and the soil temperatures will also affect root growth. And so there's an ideal soil temperature as well for roots to continue to grow well. So by those short season varieties, and usually general rule of thumb, because we have those really big swings in day and evening temperatures here, is just to add about two weeks on to whatever the maturation date is on the seed packet. So for example, here's a tomato seed packet. You would see in the description here, it says it's 65 days. It's an indeterminate tomato, 65 days to maturity. And so that's a short season crop versus a tomato that would say maybe 110 days. We know that the seasons here are usually about 90 to 100 days. And so you wanna get a shorter season crop as possible. And then you wanna go ahead and add two weeks to that. So really you're looking at the tom this tomato in another part of the country would potentially start to show some fruit set at 65 days. In Central Oregon, it's probably going to take a little bit longer than that because we have that reduction in growth during those evening temperatures. So it's kind of like the plants that start, then stop, then start, then stop. That's where the benefit of season extension of greenhouse covers can help maintain that growth through the night. Successful seed germination depends on mostly soil temperature and moisture. Light's not really a factor when you're direct seeding into the ground um, because there's no, there's no leaf tissue at that point. You really just want those seeds to get germinated. And the two key factors in getting successful germination and when you're direct seeding a crop is gonna be soil temperature and moisture. And that's even the same for starting seeds inside if you're starting them in a flat or a tray or in some uh, small pots. You want to make sure that soil temperature, you have even consistent moisture and that the soil temperature is warm enough to get those seeds germinated. Light is a factor in just a few different crops, not very many vegetable crops. So once the seeds have germinated, you have these little small seedlings pop up. And you can see on the left here, you have the cotyledon leaves. Those are the first two leaves that come out when they when the, the seeds germinate. And then after that, you'll start to see what we call the, the true leaves come on the plant. The true leaves are gonna be ones that, that actually are, look more like what the plant, what you would expect it to look like for that given crop. 
Um, once you get true leaves showing up and you have about four true leaves or more, then you can go ahead and transplant that plant into a larger size pot with potting soil if you're still trying to get it big before you plant it outside, or you can go ahead and direct plant that into the ground if the timing is right. If you started some seeds inside and you want to put them out in the ground, you want to make sure you gradually acclimate them to the outdoor environment. You can do this by taking them from the inside and putting them on the east side of the home, given east light exposure in the morning for a couple hours, and you can do this hardening off for, um, do it over a week's time, a week, week and a half, where you're just putting it out a little bit and pulling it back in. And so what you're doing is you're exposing it to the change in humidity, the change in light, and, and you won't shock the plants. Um, and so you wanna gradually acclimate or harden off these plants if you started them inside in a more cozy environment. Ideally, you can plant your transplants out on an overcast day. And for our real frost tender plants, you really wanna be waiting for June to do this. Typically the first or second week in June, you can start to put your transplants out. And again, this calendar information on when to do what, we have that all in our vegetable gardening growing guide that I'll share with you. If you're buying starts from a local nursery or from a store, you um, just be looking for healthy plant material and you know, do a little inspection on the plant. Make sure you're not bringing home aphids already to the garden. We've got enough unique challenges here that you wanna make sure that that you're introducing a healthy plant into your, your site. So do a little inspection, make sure the leaves look healthy. Um, sometimes you can gently just pop the plant out of the, the container it's being sold in and just make sure you've got a healthy root system. The plant here on the left would be an example of a healthy root system. You've got white fibrous roots um, versus the plant on the right here. You, this is, was a corn start that was being sold, popped it out of the container. You can see how root bound it is. Uh, it's going to be hard for that plant to really get fully established when it's that root bound and there's that many roots and very little soil base there. Direct seeding. Uh, most seeds need a minimum temperature to germinate successfully. Um, if, this, if it's too cold in the soil temperatures, and this could be a rookie mistake if you're new to vegetable gardening, is putting your seeds out and it's just soil temperature is just too cold. They'll usually rot before they germinate. Um, and, and once you have your seeds up and going, then it's real important to be thinning these seedlings. The, it's always a little bit tough to pull out a viable plant. I have trouble doing this myself, when you, but sometimes for certain types of vegetable crops, for example, carrots, you know, the seeds are really tiny. It's really hard to in, independently plant each seed. You'd want to go ahead and plant these seeds out and you'll have a whole bunch come up in a line, then you'd wanna go ahead and thin the seedlings. And by thinning the seedlings, you're gonna allow more root growth and there won't be as much competition for nutrients and water. So you'll end up with a more viable harvest, uh, a larger yield and a higher quality set uh, harvest as well. So here's that publication I've mentioned a few times now, Growing Vegetables in Central Oregon. We have it available on our website here in both English and we also have a Spanish version. And so you can go ahead and take a look at the publication. And a lot of what we're talking about here today is gonna to be in that guide. Give you a few minutes to write that down. You can just write down the title and do a search or go to the extension catalog and it's um, EM9128. If you open up the guide, inside the guide, we have a chart that talks about soil temperature range. And this is what you're gonna wanna use if you're direct seeding a crop or putting a crop in the ground. It's just gonna tell you the ideal range for that plant to be successful. So for example, if you're gonna put carrot seeds in the ground, uh, you can see 40 degrees would be the minimum soil temperature range that you want to have at, at consistently. And so these temperature ranges, you wanna be consistently measuring them. What you do is go out at the same time every morning, for example, say 10 o'clock in the morning, take a soil thermometer, go out there 
and put it in the ground and see what that temperature is and do this a couple days in a row. Once you start to get consistent soil temperatures as the soil continues to warm as we get into spring and summer, then you would know if you're in that range for having that optimum soil temperature for direct seeding or putting your crops in the ground. And so you can see, for example, with the carrot, is 40 degrees. If you go across, the optimum range would be between 45 and 85. And you can see that um, optimum box, that square where uh, with for carrots, for example, says 80. 80 is going to be the ideal. If you had to pick and choose, if you would wait for the soil temperatures to be at 80 degrees, um, you're going to get some, some good successful germination there because that's the ideal soil temperature for germinating carrot seeds. So it, that's going to be, there's going to be a couple of different crops listed in there. Uh, we've got two page spread on this particular chart in the guide to the left. Vegetable types can be broken out into different categories based on their preferred temperatures and their frost tolerance. And this kind of helps you to determine when to plant something out here in Central Oregon. So a vegetable type. You've got hardy, semi-hardy, tender, and very tender or warm season crops. Um, and I'll just let you look at this chart. But again, in our vegetable gardening guide that we have online, we will list if something is frost sensitive or frost tolerant. So you have a sense of that. But basically hardy and semi-hardy crops, and I give some examples of those crops to the right. It's not all of the crops, but it's just an example of some of the more common ones. These ones are going to do okay and probably going to be able to survive a little bit of frost or be tolerant of frost. Um, and then this is suggested date, for example, putting out broccoli or kale would be two to four weeks before the date of the average last spring frost, which in Central Oregon would be, we use the first or second week of June as kind of the, the passing date for when the real serious frost danger may be less of a concern here. And so those hardy crops and semi-hardy crops, you could potentially be putting out sometime in May. Um, there's a few that are really cold hardy, like for example, kale. Some of you probably even have grown kale and it lives through the winters here. So there's a few of them that are really cold hardy, but the rest of them you probably wanna be waiting to put out until May. And then your tender crops, for example, something like beans or cucumber, they don't really like wind. They can be a little finicky in the cold temperatures. You want to plant them right after frost danger. And so usually that first week in June is okay for those types of crops. And then your very tender crops like tomatoes, eggplants, anything that's in the sun-loving family, you really want to wait a couple of weeks until after the frost danger has passed and then also have frost protection in place like walls of water, which I'll show you some images of later and then some frost cloth. So here's another page from the vegetable gardening growing guide. And you can see there, for example, when you look at kohlrabi, we're gonna recommend if direct seed or transplant is the ideal way to start that crop. Um, so for example, with lettuce, direct seeding is usually preferred. It doesn't mean you can't start some, some lettuce from seeds. It's just usually they perform well and do just as as well from direct seeding into the ground or to the container. Um, and we're gonna mention there if something is frost tolerant or frost sensitive as well. And you can see, we'll list a few of the more common varieties, ones that are usually easier for people to get, how to plant it, some hints with that particular crop and uh, some tips on harvesting. But no, really you have a lot of choices when it comes to varieties. Again, because most of these crops are annual crops, it's just really about selecting short season crops. And some of the, there are some seed companies that have a really nice selection of short season seed packets. Um, I'll mention a few of them that I know of. So you can either go to these companies, order online, or go to your local garden center and buy from them. But some of these companies include Territorial Seed, Nichols Garden Supply, and, um, Johnny Selected Seeds, Botanical Interests, some of those companies and uh, are ones that are, they have a nice selection of short season varieties for more cold growing regions. Okay. 
Okay, so here's just some photos of some hardy crops uh, that uh, we grew at the demonstration garden. So sometimes it's fun just to try some of these fun uh, colors and different different types of the traditional crop. There's some red romaine lettuce. We did a purple Vienna kohlrabi. Here are some examples of semi-hardy crops. We did cauliflower graffiti, the Swiss chard bright lights works well here. You know, and some crops are ones that you continue to harvest and they continue to grow. And some you just have that one time of harvesting. Sometimes it's good when we're talking about growing tomatoes, which seems to be one of the most popular crops for somebody to grow. You know, determinate tomatoes will produce and set and be done producing. And so sometimes determinant tomatoes can be a good option for here to get that established fruit set and, and have that final harvest. And determinant tomatoes will continue to set fruit and continue to grow. And so you can, you can um, decide which you preferred based on what you're gonna be using it for. Here's some examples of tender crops. We've got the squash papaya and some green beans that we've grown and some very tender crops. So even though these plants in particular can be frost sensitive and uh, aren't the easiest ones to grow here, the, the key with growing something like eggplant, for example, is not to grow the full-sized eggplant, but to grow the miniature eggplants. Again, because it's not going to take them as long to get mature, so you should have success. We've grown Hansel, we've grown the variety Gretel, we've grown uh, a variety called Fairy Tail, and they're all real small, kind of individual serving size eggplants, but they get to maturity here, so they work well. Same with the watermelons. You can do watermelons here, but grow the ones that are single serving size instead of the full large watermelons that you're used to seeing in the grocery stores. So there's a lot of single serving size watermelons that don't get very large in size, just enough for a family of say four or something like that. And those are the ones that you will have success with here if, if you pick those varieties that are short season or single size or compact. Okay, um, let's see here. So watering. Um, really, you just want to make sure you have even consistent watering, whether you're hand watering or using an automatic irrigation system. You can use a lot of different options for irrigation if you're setting up an irrigation system. Drip line is going to be the most water, con uh, water conserving or as far as um, most efficient. However, you need to make sure that it's lined up so where the holes in the, dr in the drip line are going to be getting to the root system of the plant evenly and consistently. Ideally, watering in the morning is the best time if you have the choice. You want to water um, not so early in the morning that you might have some freezing occurring, but you want to water early enough in the morning that the sun can dry off any of the foliage if the foliage is getting wet by the way that you're watering. So um, ideally in the morning, allowing the water to be taken up during the day and any of the foliage to be dried off during the day. If you water at night here, you can do that, but just there's a slight risk of increasing a certain plant diseases like powdery mildew because moisture will be sitting on the leaves throughout the whole uh, evening and not getting dried off. And so that creates a better environment for certain types of plant disease. And so ideally you're watering in the morning here. There's usually less wind as well in the mornings that you won't lose as much to evaporation. By amending the soil, you'll, you'll increase that water holding capacity. So your water will extend, essentially go further for you rather than if you're not amending the soil at all, it's gonna drain right through. There are four critical times when a plant is growing that water is needed most um, consistently. Is, is the key there. And so when you're germinating seeds, consistent moisture, if you're letting your trays dry out in between, or if you're letting, if you're direct seeding in the garden and you're letting it dry out between uh, waterings, then you're not going to get even consistent germination. Right after transplanting, when you want to get those roots established, you want to make sure you have even consistent moisture. Um, and during the first few weeks of development, and uh, during the development of 
edible storage organs. Yes, that's a, that's a phrase to say that. But those are going to be the part that you're going to be eating. As that part is developing, if you don't have even consistent moisture, then you're going to end up with deformities, cracking, for example, in tomatoes. If you have water, inconsistent watering when your tomatoes are setting fruit, that's when you'll get that cracking. If it's like getting too much moisture and then not enough moisture on and off or it's drying out between waterings, you want even consistent moisture when the, the edible part of the, the plant is developing so that you have um, the cells developing fully in that part of the plant. Fertilizers, uh, just some basic information on fertilizers. Organics come from plants or animals and inorganic fertilizers come from minerals or chemical processes. So um, regardless of which type of fertilizer you use, both provide nutrients to the plants. The plants are gonna take up the nitrogen form, whether it's coming from an organic fertilizer or an inorganic fertilizer. And so just be aware that um, this is how the plant, th these are where the fertilizers are derived from, but from the plant's ability to take them up, it's going to be the same as long as the nutrient is available in that fertilizer form. So you want to be applying it routinely, it depends on the needs. And there's a lot of variables here on how often you should be applying fertilizers. Number one, you want to read the label directions of the fertilizer type that you bought. But normally a basic fertilizer like A101010, it's going to work for most of your vegetable crops. Some crops are more heavy feeders and some are light feeders, so you'll want to do a little research on your crop. But generally speaking, a basic fertilizer is going to work for most. Um, and you're going to want to put the fertilizer down, make sure you're reading the label as far as how frequently you can be applying that particular type of fertilizer, because some fertilizers are fast release and some are slow release. And then just make sure, and sometimes you can use a compost, worm castings, all of these different types of um, amendments that can also be providing nutrients can work as well. And there's fish emulsions, seaweed, kelp emulsions. There's a lot of different ways to go here. So it really depends on what crops you're growing and which fertilizer you, you choose. Plant clay plant care or general plant care, just be monitoring for insects and diseases. It's a lot easier to manage those in an organic way if you're catching it early on. For example, the picture here of the tomato hornworm, you know, if you're out there inspecting, usually they're not going to show up in droves, at least uh, not right away. And so you may be able to just remove something like that quickly if you see one or two on your plant before they can um, multiply and eat them overnight. So by monitoring, you can troubleshoot. Um, sometimes maybe you have some disease showing up on part of the plant. Just cut that part off and hopefully prevent the spread from that disease. Just use integrated pest management techniques for any type of insect or disease control. If you're not sure why the plant is damaged or doesn't look like it's doing well, that's where you can call the OSU Master Gardener Plant Clinic. You can talk to one of our trained Master Gardener volunteers, or you can talk to myself or... or another staff member about what's happening with my plant so that we can give you some research-based suggested management for whatever the issue is that's going on. You wanna make sure you're managing for weeds accordingly because the weeds compete for water and nutrients. And some other things to think about, crop rotation's a really good idea. Um, this is so that you don't have a buildup of insect or plant disease in the soils. Uh, so the idea with crop rotation is that insect and diseases are host specific. So for example, you may have aphids that show up on your tomato plants and they're going to be specific just to, to, to plants that are in that same family as the tomato family, the Solanaceae family, the sun loving family. So they would show up potentially on tomatoes, peppers, eggplant. Um, whereas those aphids that are, are of a certain species would not cross over to the broccoli because they're very host specific. Same with plant diseases. You'll get certain fungal pathogens that are specific to a crop and probably a plant family. And so the idea is that if you're rotating your crops routinely, that even if you have a buildup in pest population, that if you put a different plant family in that same location every third season or fourth season, 
then even though there may be a critter in the soil that likes to chew on the roots of tomato plants, maybe it doesn't chew on the roots of broccoli plants. And so that's something to think about. You can keep track of where you have plants and try and move your, your crops around. It's a little more difficult to do in a sm small gardening space, but it's just something to think about. If you have a way to manage crop rotation, that's a good idea to do that. And now I'm gonna just talk for a few minutes about season extenders, and then I'll go ahead and take questions at the end here or look at the Q&A and see what questions need to get answered. Uh, so season extension would be anything that helps extend the growing season from raised beds, raised beds like I mentioned all the way up through greenhouses if you're lucky to have the space for a greenhouse that's a good option so greenhouses can help extend the season just by getting your seeds started and in some cases you can grow in the greenhouse year-round if you're able to keep the heat from getting too hot in there you can build something like this this is a cloche and we've got um, a website a based publication on how to build a cloche like this if you're wanting to do something like this at home um, if you're using plastic to create cover or some sort of a high tunnel or low tunnel like this, you just want to make sure you are purchasing, ideally try and purchase greenhouse grade plastic. It's going to be thicker and UV treated so it lasts longer. If you just get construction grade plastic, uh, it's like, the, like a home supply store, then it's probably going to break down in one season. So the greenhouse grade plastic is a little bit thicker. It's usually six mil and it's going to last a couple of seasons. Usually it'll last about three seasons here, maybe four seasons in Central Oregon versus just construction grade plastic or polyethylene. Uh, I've seen a lot of creative ways to use row cover or frost cloth. This cloth is nice because air, water, and light get through it, but it can protect your plants from frost damage. It can also protect them from certain insects. You can use something like row cover and put it over your cabbage so that you don't get the cabbage moth laying its eggs on top of your cabbage and the larvae feeding and creating uh, damage on your cabbage leaves. So there's different ways to use the frost cloth as well, but it's a good one to have here for those cold nights. Here's just some, I've shown you just some different examples of how people use frost cloth. low tunnels, all of those can be really helpful, especially early in the season here to extend the season. You can use things just like an upside down pot. Here's a plastic container. Um, you have some plants in the ground. You hear it's gonna get really cold that night, drop below 32 degrees. You wanna go out and protect your plants. Just throw something like this on the plant overnight and then take it off again the next day when it starts to warm up again. These are wall of waters and uh, the wall of water can work really well in protecting, especially this, the frost tender plants. And the way that this works is it's, you would set this up around your plant. I usually use a five gallon bucket, put this around the five gallon bucket because the bucket will help hold it in place. It's a little unstable when you're first filling it with water. And then you, then you fill each of those individual cells with water. And the idea is that the water will heat up in the day during um, when the sun is hitting it, it'll heat up and increase the air temperature inside the wall of water and then emit that heat back out at night to protect those plants from frost. And so they work really well for tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and extending the season or protecting it here. i just shown you some examples of raised beds using walls of water. Some people use them just in the beginning of the season and take them off before the plant gets, gets too big and others will leave them on the whole season. And just to show you uh, Holland's Head a little later in the season, just to show you a lot of the variety and options you have, you can, you can grow different crops here depending on the microclimate where you live and, and your site but there's a lot of different options to grow a variety of different things in Central Oregon. So you can do it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead now, there's, I'm gonna pull up some resource pages for you and then I'm gonna look at the Q&A and see if I can answer any questions for you.